so as Daniel said, I'm in North Canterbury. So a little bit about myself. Um, as you can probably tell by my accent, I'm from South Africa, from the Eastern Cape of South Africa. Uh, there's a little square down here. It's a place called East London, which is a very confusing name for being in South Africa. That's in the Eastern Cape on the coast and famous for where this is where Courtney Latimer found the coelacanth. Uh, what she saw it on a fishing boat. So the coelacanth was that fish that they thought was extinct for ages from the Cretaceous. And then suddenly they saw it on a fishing boat, causing a bit of consternation. And we also had a dodo. So there's a dodo and a dodo egg in our museum. So that's kind of what got me interested in fossils. But in South Africa, you're not allowed to collect fossils because there's so many hominid fossils around. So it's a complete ban on that. Um, we also had these cool footprints. So in the middle of the screen at the bottom, uh, you can see there's some bird footprints, but there's some also some human footprints. And I think they've been dated to about 124,000 years old. Uh, my day job, I'm a software engineer. So I've been a software engineer for the last 20 years. And I've just enrolled first year geology, biology at the University of Canterbury, just to get a bit more uh, knowledge around fossils and geology. I was bitten by the fossil bug when I went to Mottenau Beach. Uh, we just went there on a holiday. So I've been here in New Zealand about seven, eight years now. Went to go check out uh, Mottenau Island because there was an island off the coast there. Found this piece of bone here on the left. And I was like, well, what other fossils are around here? And then I found a crab. So you can see on the right there. And I wanted to see what the crab looked like. So I got one of those electric Dremel engravers and slowly prepped away and it took ages, but yeah, eventually I managed to find uh, the crab in the middle there and I was hooked. So that's how I got into the fossil side of things. And I made a few videos um, about four years ago. Uh, yeah, just as I started, I made some videos to mainly show people back in South Africa and some of my friends what I was up to and it took off. So uh, there was quite an interest in it. So I've made 216 videos by now of fossil hunting in New Zealand. Um, found that I really had a passion for sharing uh, knowledge about fossils. So I've, um, I've been involved in some education in the schools uh, and started this, uh, well not started, but I'm involved in the Geobusters Club here in Christchurch, which is part of the uh, the Can Can Canterbury Madrone and Lapidary Club. So it's just kind of the youth arm of that, where we show um, kids about fossils and geology. And I recently did a penguin, but I, I did a time lapse of the prep, and you can see it's been viewed 80 million times on YouTube. Oh, sorry, 80 million times on TikTok and 62 million times on YouTube. So that one video has been viewed like 140 million times. So it's, it's definitely getting out there, um, and it's really... Uh, causing people to ask questions about why, why is there a penguin inside an egg, you know, and how did it get there? So it's, it's definitely starting conversations. And where do I find fossils? I'm mainly in this red square on the left-hand side here. So this is North Canterbury uh, up to Kaikoura, the, that area. Uh, a lot of Miocene cliffs. This is Martinel on the right here. You've got these cliffs and these concretions falling out of the cliffs eroding. Um, then there's also a bit of Conway formation, some Cretaceous, some older rocks around. You can see there's usually there's like this younger Pleistocene layer at the top there that also erodes down. So you get a bit of a mix on the beaches. It's very difficult to kind of place where something's from. You can't just you know assume it's from the Miocene because you've got Pleistocene also out of the rivers. You've got eroding Eocene green sand and all sorts of things. So it's a bit of a challenge when you find something to accurately dated and tell where it's from. And speaking of concretions, that's kind of where most of the fossils I find are in. And if you look here, this is down at Glen Affric. If you look up at the cliff, you can see this line over here. Um, can everyone see my mouse pointer? I hope so. Just give me a nod if you can, cool. So you've got this line of concretions forming here. And then I've zoomed in at the, at the bottom here and there's a concretion, there's one, there's one. And they're forming these lines. And the concretions, as I understand it, and I'm still first year geology, so I might get some of these things wrong. So shout out if I do. But you've got this um, this mudstone, the siltstone, all these little fragments of all sorts of plagioclases, quartzes, and it's been cemented together by your calcite, your uh, calcium carbonate. 
And that's what's kind of cemented these, these round concretions together. So they're a lot harder than the surrounding cliff, which is why they erode down where the, um, the mudstone and the siltstone just gets washed away. Uh, these concretions fall down to the beach and they can stay there for quite a while. And if the tide is right and the sand level's low enough, you find some really cool treasures in there. Now I've read up a bit on concretions and I've heard that, you know, it precipitates around a nucleus. That's one theory. And then there's also a theory over here where they can form quite quickly. And that's from Yoshida's uh, paper that he wrote. And he was studying these tusk shells in Japan. Now tusk shells, uh, I don't think it's a shell so much as it's um, a tiny, um, is it an invertebrate? But yeah, it's, um, it's not a shell, but it, uh, yeah, not a gastropod, it's more animal. And what he was finding is that these concretions were forming just at the one end of the shell. So he thought, you know, it doesn't really line up with the precipitation method. And his theory is that the fatty acids from the decomposition kickstart this chemical process where it forms just around the end where it's seeping out from. So it's not forming around the whole shell, you know, in a circular way. It's just forming at the side where there's that decomposition. So that's another theory I've seen. And this is a crab I found down at Glen Africa. And it kind of shows how that's possible. Um, you know, I'm no expert when it comes to concretion shapes, but this one has just formed the concretion around the edges of the crab where you would think the decomposition would be able to escape from the crab carapace. So I thought that was quite interesting. You also find these microfossils in the cliff. I do find little lenses every now and again of uh, four rams and inside these little lenses, you can find tiny shark teeth. You can find uh, fish otoliths, really tiny ones. You can see that's a fish. Uh, that's a fish otolith there, I think, that one over there. So they're really, really small. And then if you're lucky, every now and again, you come across these, these little areas where there's all these tiny shark teeth from your know, deep water, cookie cutter type, uh, delicious shark. And they're quite fun to find and sift out. Take ages to get enough sediment, but yeah, it's quite fun to find them. This is a one centimeter cube, so you can see how tiny they are. They don't form in concretions from what I've seen, uh, same as these forearms, they just kind of loosen the cliffs. And like I mentioned, there was this younger layer. So at the top of the, the cliff, you've got this, um, not really overburden, but there's another layer on top, uh, which I think is Pleistocene. I've heard mention of about 80,000 to 100,000 years old in some places. And now and again, you get these moa bones falling down onto the beach from that layer. Here's a nice tarsal metatarsus over here. Very good condition. I'm not even sure if it's fossilized. It's, it feels like just normal bone. This one is a bit more uh, fossilized. This one is also just the bottom of a tarsal metatarsus. And then you also find these tiny, tiny bones. Unsure what this one is. Uh, it might be something like a gecko. I saw um, a presentation the other day by Nick Rollins and this looked very much like some of the gecko bones you were showing. And then of course, prep methods. This is what I really enjoy is prepping fossils. And I've got a few methods on the right hand side there. There's some really nice Cretaceous shark vertebra and they're really big. That would have been like a five, six meter shark, that one. And so the methods I use air scribe, acid, micro air abrasion, which I've just kind of gotten into. And then also I'll talk a little bit about digital prep methods, which is quite interesting. And then I usually use a combination. So air scribe on acid, air scribe or micro air abrasion. Uh, so I'm of the opinion you can't ever have enough air scribes. So <laughs> uh, every now and again, when there's a new air scribe that comes out, I'm like, well, I, I probably need that. <laughs> Even if I spend most of my time just with this middle one over here. Um, so air scribe for those who haven't come across them before, it's like a mini jackhammer. It's running off your compressor, so it's got air pumping out the front and it's uh, moving up and down 6,000 times a minute and it's like a tiny jackhammer. It's not rotating, so you're not sanding away at the fossil, you're actually knocking chips off. And that's a great way to get, if you've got good separation with your fossil, you, you never want to touch the fossil with the, you know, the stylus of the air scrub. You will always want to 
just be working on the matrix. And when you get the matrix thin enough uh, over the top of the fossil, it cracks away and that jet of air just shoots it away. So you, you get a really good finish on that. Um, yeah, like I say, the ideal where there's good separation between fossil and matrix. So I'll talk about sticky fossils. They're very noisy. So your neighbors might complain. I've had to soundproof my area um, because they can be real noisy and real dusty. This is the method I use the most. Um, and it's probably quite, it's the most versatile one, I would think. You, you can use this on pretty much every fossil to some extent, especially if you want to speed up a acid prep. Uh, on the left-hand side here, we've got a Paleo Tools Microjack. And this is one you almost want to use under a microscope. So if you've got a stereo microscope, you probably want to be using that as it's so fine and really small bits of sediment you're taking away. Then I've got two German Haufwerk, I think I'm pronouncing that right, uh, air scrubs that are kind of a little bit, um, they can remove more matrix than this one. This is my workhorse, this is my Ken Mannion TT. This is the one I probably use 90% of the time. These two on the right, I just got in the mail like two days ago. So I haven't had time to use them, but they, the ones are T-Rex from Paleozoic. And the other ones also a Haufwerk one, a German one. And then I've got this massive one over here that you have to use two hands with. And you can probably only use that for 20 minutes before you, you need to take a break. It's, it's a pretty powerful one. And that's if you want to remove lots of matrix. Uh, I've kind of stayed away from angle grinders because an angle grinder creates so much dust that you can't see what you're doing. You might cut into the fossil if it's in an unexpected area without knowing that. So this is where this one comes in. Uh, it takes big chunks out, uh, but you can still see what you're doing. So if you run into the fossil, you can stop. So I've got a few examples here. This one on the right, this is a heavily pyrotized crab from Martinel. And I've got a video that I'll quickly show, which will show you, you the fact that you're not touching the fossil, you're just making that uh, matrix as thin as you can, and it will crack and then be removed. Then I've also got the shark tooth here from Martinel on the left, and then this giant crab. So let me just quickly load those up. So this is how I found it. And it's full of iron pyrite. So you can see over there, you, you're just working away and it starts cracking. And it's actually removing uh, the airstream from the front will actually shoot those little bits of rock away, leaving the carapace of the crab. This is probably a good way of seeing it. So I'm never really touching the fossil. I'm always just just working my way along the matrix. And then eventually it cracks and is blown away by that stream of air. Is the video playing okay? Can everyone see that? Cool. Yeah, I won't play the whole thing, but yeah, I carry on like that. And the next one is the shark too. So air scrubs work really well with crabs and shark teeth because they tend to have very good separation between that, uh, the fossil and the matrix. So I've sped this one up quite a bit. Uh, the thing about air scrubs is it's slow. You're looking at, um, I think this was quite a quick prep, but this is still two hours of work to remove this shark tooth from the matrix. So once again, you're never touching the um, shark tooth and you can see the vibrations actually remove that one from it. And then I'll show you, this is a big tomato carcinous crab that I found at Glen Africa. And this one, this was about 200 hours of work, this one. So once again, I'll speed it up. I'm putting B72 paraloid over the top there. And that's just to protect the crab because you've got that jet of air coming out the front. If there's a tiny crack in the carapace, it will sometimes go in under that and then lift it off. This is quite a big crab. It's about 33 centimeters wide there. It's quite satisfying seeing it come out like this because when you're working on it, it's such a slow process. Uh, this was done over a couple of weeks, so it's not done in one sitting. So as you can imagine, 
with 200 hours. So yeah, I started off with 16.4 kilograms of rock. Oh, sorry. I started off with 25 kilograms of rock and I removed 16 kilograms uh, to be left with this seven kilogram rock. So it's, uh, it's quite a process <laughs> to get it to this stage. Any questions on that side of things? Then I have to touch on the PPE. You know, I don't want to be uh, the nanny state, but it's very important to wear the, the correct uh, personal protective equipment. I've got these gloves that reduce the vibration because the vibration can actually damage your nerves. If you use that air scrub for too long, you've got a respirator for the, the uh, dust, even though I've got a dust extraction system. And of course, eye protection and gloves when you use the acid. Speaking of dust, this is what I've done to kind of get dust under control in my workshop. So I work in a smaller room inside my garage. And what I've done is I've used this. Uh, this is a dust collector from a woodworking workshop that I've got to trade me. And what it's doing is it's pulling the, the air from where I use the air scribe. And I've just made this box. And inside this box, this plywood box is a five micron bag which collects some of the dust and then it goes out into this larger area and gets pushed out through these HEPA filters, which takes care of the rest of the dust. So this system is working quite well. Uh, I haven't really figured out how I'm going to open it up to take the dust out, but yeah, so far it's working really well. Otherwise you've got this really nuisance dust everywhere. So there's this fine layer of dust over everything if you're not taking care of your dust. So acid prep, this is another method that I use to prep fossils. So you've got the air scrub um, for fossils where there's really good separation. Then you've got acid for when the fossil's sticky. And when it's sticky, you've got the matrix stuck onto the fossil and you don't want to use the, the stylus of the air scrub too much to touch the fossil. So you can try and scrape it off, but I found that you get a really good result with this acid. So I use acetic acid, 80%, and then I dilute it down to about seven to 10%. And what the acetic acid's doing is it's it's dissolving this calcite cement mm. in your concretion. Then it just, the rest of the sediment then just falls away. You have to have the B72 to protect your fossil. So bone that's exposed, you, you're covering up before you put in the acid, it's very slow. So you're talking months. With the air scrub, you're talking hundreds of hours, you know, maybe a hundred hours. Uh, acid prepping is months. You're gonna, it's so many cycles. And after each cycle, you have to put in water to get all that, you know, acid out before you put the B72 over to consolidate the bones. And I often use it with my air scribe. So I use the air scribe to remove the bulk. And then I come in with the acid to clean it up. And this is what I did with this work in progress turtle skull. So I found this at Martinel. I literally parked my car and it was in front of my car where I found this turtle skull. And when I found it, this little bit over here was sticking out. I thought it could be a vertebra, maybe like a whale vert or something like that, but the bone texture was quite different to a whale. Um, so I brought it home and thought, let me give it a quick prep. And I started prepping it with the air scribe. I had good separation to a point and then it got real sticky, but I could see this wasn't a whale vertebra. It was completely different. So what I do is I remove the rock with my air scribe but except for the last millimeter or so. So if you look here, there's a little bit of a patch here of sediment I've left. And then I put it in the acid and you get this really great finish on it. So this is a, a zoomed in view of the, the skull there. And you can see these little suture lines and all sorts of things going on here. And the, you could never do that with the air scrub. You couldn't, you know, hot, you'd damage it. <laughs> It'd be quite, um, quite a process, but the, the acid can go in there. And then after the acid bath and it goes into water for two days, then I coat it in B72 and I repeat the process until all the um, sediment, all the matrix is gone from that. What I do find is that you have to come in after like half an hour or so with a tiny toothbrush and just brush away the sediment because otherwise the sediment just sits on top and stops the reaction from getting at the, uh, the matrix below that. I've tried out these two acids. So I started off with sulfamic acid, which is a, a bit stronger than acetic acid. 
uh, after reading a few papers, they were using this sulfamic acid uh, quite a bit for big plesiosaurs in South America. And they very kindly sent me a paper on it. Uh, you use it as a lime descaler, which sounds great for limestone removal. Uh, but I found it's, it's, it gave me results, unexpected results. So I used it on some little bone clusters, which like vertebrae and things that weren't really scientifically valuable, just as an example or just as an experiment. And I found that with acetic acid, I was getting really good reproducible results. So with the sulfamic acid, every now and again, I would take the fossil out of the acid and be a bit surprised by my results, which is not really what you want with acid. So I just found that acetic acid gives you a really good result. Uh, one thing you have to watch out for is the, the exposed cancellous material. So if you look over here, we've got a nice cross section of a cetacean mandible close to the coracoid, I think. So the coracoid process is going up here and you've got the exposed you know, honeycombing. And this is actually filled in with calcite. So that's, the acid's gonna love that. It will dissolve that as quick or quicker than the sediment. So you have to be really careful with covering that with your B72, multiple layers. So I start off with a really thin layer to penetrate. And then I come over with a really thick layer of B72 across, you know, over that to make sure that the acid doesn't get in. Because if the acid starts getting into this cancellous material over here, it turns into a sponge and it just falls apart. Uh, the same over here, I've got this mystery bone cluster, but you can see all the, the structure of the bones exposed. So I have to be really careful. Up the top here, I've used um, wax. So I've used candle wax to go over the top of the bone, but I found that the candle wax actually um, hid some of the acid from view. So the acid was actually going under the candle wax and attacking the bone. And I couldn't see it because the candle wax goes quite opaque afterwards. So I've kind of stayed away from the candle wax, but some people use it and get very good results. Yeah, so we just talked about the candle wax. So there's just a closer view of the candle wax. And this was a bone cluster, which I thought was just uh, a piece of vertebra over there. And so I was quite cowboy with it. But if you look over here, that's actually a dolphin ear bone, which was hiding under the sediment. So I've sent that off to Felix Marx there, to Papa. And I think he started prepping it some further. But yeah, it's a beautiful uh, dolphin ear bone. It's still got, it's got both pieces, the bulla and the periotic articulated. So they're in beautiful shape. Uh, I talk about B72 quite a bit. So this is what it looks like. You can buy big packets of it. A kilogram will last you years. And it's not too expensive, but you mix that with your acetone and you just paint it over your fossils as a consolidant. And it's also great for things that you don't want to degrade further. So if you've got something with a bit of pyrite on it, it should stop at least the, the outer you know, area of the pyrite uh, getting in contact with the moisture from the air. So it's, it's really great and uh, it's reversible, which is uh, very important. Now, when you use your acid, it's, um, it's very good to use a buffer. So you don't want the, the acid to attack the bone if you can help it. So you supersaturate the acid with your calcium phosphate. It's because your, your fossil bones in most locations have got a lot of phosphate in them. So if you saturate the solution with phosphate, then uh, usually it will attack the calcium carbonate more than the bone. But yeah, I've, I've had really good results from the, the acetic acid, actually. Also, you can use that soup method where you just keep some of the acetic acid in the solution at all times. And then that acts as a natural buffer as well. Okay, so we've got an example here of where I've used a combination this is my first penguin. So I've been looking for a penguin for ages, ever since I found out that there were penguins to be found in Martineau. Uh, I mean, I must, yeah, this was three years of looking for this penguin. So I found it on the beach over here and I could see these little bits of bone. And they definitely looked like it could be penguin. It's the right size, it was right texture. Um, as you might tell, I've looked at a lot of fossil penguins over the years, uh, trying to be ready for that one time when I do find a fossil. Uh, so I've used the air scribe to remove the majority of the matrix. So you can see over here, started working on the right hand side, we've got the wishbone, got the nice wing, it's very well articulated, bit of the skull, uh, even the ribs are there. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to really take my time because this is a, 
not something you find every day. So as you can see, this was, it took about five months of work. So I found it in October and I finished it October last year or August, October last year. And I finished it in January this year. So it was quite a, quite a project. 120 hours probably with the Airscribe and at least 60 asset cycles. So you put in the asset for an hour or two, then you put it in fresh water overnight and you refresh the water a few times. Got a video of this. This is the one that was viewed like 140 million times. Let's find that penguin. So once again, I've sped it up so we don't have to sit here for 120 hours watching the Airscribe. What I'm doing, yes, I'm just going till I can start seeing the discoloration of the matrix when it gets close to the bone. Uh, and you pop it in acid, pop it in water, and you start seeing a nice penguin. So if you, I'll just pause it over here and you can actually see the texture of the bone. It's full of these micro, you know, fractures. So the bone, the fossil bone, I think as it's being fossilized, it's shrinking and, you know, ex expanding again. So it gets these little cracks in it. So you have to be really careful with the acid because these cracks get filled in with calcite. You have to come in with your B72 and be very, very careful that you don't leave a crack, the edge of a crack open like this one. So the acid can work its way in over there. You have to be really you know, good with your B72. So you can see I've gone over a little bit over the edge just to make sure that I cover up all the, the bits of bone there. Um, I've sped these up quite a bit, but the originals are online. So if you want to look at the, the slower version, these are just the quick ones uh, to show you. I was also very lucky. So you can see this is the edge of the tibiotarsus um, just before the tarsometatarsus. And I was quite upset because the tarsometatarsus and the penguin is like the diagnostic bone where you can put it into the penguin lineage. And it looked like this one was actually missing because the, the concretion, it kind of stopped uh, at the ankle. And a lot of the Martinelle concretions do that. They stop at the ankle and stop kind of there at the neck vertebra. So you don't have the skull and you don't have the TMT. But when I flipped this over, the TMT had actually fallen in under the back of the leg. So it's sitting there perfectly at the back. You can see when it gets shiny like this, this is me putting lots of B72 on. Um, very well articulated. You can see that that wings got the bones coming off there, the radius and the ulna over there, the legs are in place, the, the femurs there, even the patella is there. It's, it's got pretty much every bone you could wish for, um, except for the TMT, but luckily it's at the back there. Um, sorry, I'll just go back quickly there. Uh, this is, I was just showing on the video, this is where I leave it with the air scrub. So you can kind of make out the shape of that uh, coracoid going there. And I've left like that last millimeter of rock over the top of it. And that's what I use the acid for. So I, I, I removed that last millimeter of rock um, because otherwise you're going to get marks from the air scribe. So if I use my air scribe to scrape away at that, uh, you'll get a good result. But if you look at it under a microscope, you'll definitely see the scratches of the, the air scribe. Now, this is after that acid. So now you can see I'm down to the bone. So there's the coracoid going into the humerus, all the other bones. Don't want to get them wrong, but radius and ulna in there and the rest of the bones. And there's that furcular. It's a beautiful little tail vertebra of the, the penguin. And then I come in with the smaller air scrub for a little bit more delicate work. And the final coat of the B72. So that's kind of where I left the penguin. Uh, all the diagnostic bones are visible. Uh, here's another example. So this is another one where I've used 
the air scribe with acid. If you're looking on the left hand side, this is from the Conway formation. So I can see there's a, a rounded edge of a vertebra sticking out there. So you can just kind of see the, the little bit of the edge there and there's a tiny bit sticking out there. And that's the corresponding one there. So that's the piece that got a little bit abraded when it was tumbling down the river, got a little bit worn down. And what's nice about the Conway formation concretions, or at least the ones I've been uh, working on, they've got slightly larger grains in them. So they're more like a sandstone than a mudstone. Probably not quite a sandstone, but they, they're definitely bigger. And what I found is with the, the bigger the grains, the, the better the acid is at it. So the acid is really a vigorous bubbling when you put this in and you don't have to spend as much time. So this one was a lot, you can see only 20 acid cycles, 50 hours of the air scrub. So a lot quicker than the penguin. Also a lot simpler, but a very good elasmosaurus uh, the long neck plesiosaur uh, vertebra. It's got all the little bits that normally get uh, broken off as it tumbles down the river. So it's got all the processes going off. On either side, I've got a, um, a over here on the right hand side, you can see it's quite shiny and that's from the B72. So that's just, uh, you can see it's got really nice cracks in there. Once again, filled in with some kind of calcite probably, uh, but the acid does a great job I couldn't prep that with the air scribe, all those little nooks and crannies in there. And it's got these, I think they're called foramen, where there's extra blood supply because they've got such a long neck. So they've got these two holes on either side there. Got a quick video. Sorry, I'm really into videos. I, I do like making videos and showing them. So there we go. Yeah, yeah, I've got that big air scribe. Um, I'll explain a little bit what happened there. So <laughs> I thought that there was nothing in this part of the concretion. So this part of the concretion, I was like, oh, there's no bone there. This is the shape. Um, the process is coming here, the process is going there. And then when it broke off, I saw there was a piece of bone there. So I quickly had to glue it back in place and carry on the prep. So yeah, you live and learn. Um, there you can see how vigorous this reaction is compared to the previous one. You're getting lots of bubbles coming out of it. It's, it's reacting really well with that acetic acid. Starting to see this process popping out the, the bottom over here. Once again, yeah, back into the acetic acid. And yeah, starting to, you can start seeing the shape now of it. I'll just skip ahead a little bit. Uh, that's where I had the angle grinder for one <laughs> a little bit, but yeah, that's, I was definitely sure there wasn't bone in that piece. Uh, and then um, one thing I really don't like about prepping is having to smooth out the rock afterwards. So it looks pretty. So this is called landscaping. So I come in and smooth out the matrix. I'm really bad at doing that, but there's the, the piece you saw vertebra and it's one of the dorsal ones. Uh, I didn't know that myself. I sent it off to a plesiosaur expert in South America and he, he, he told me that's where it's from. So don't be too impressed. <laughs> then micro air abrasion. So this is my newest uh, prep technique. Micro air abrasion is basically like sandblasting, but at a micro scale. So you're using between 50 and 100 micron grains uh, to shoot out at a fossil. So I've only prepped oh, two or three fossils using micro air abrasion. It's not something, uh, one reason is I've only recently got it, but because I prefer acid if I have to prep bone, uh, because over here on the right hand side, so this is probably an extreme one, but you've got bone on the left here uh, before it was micro air abraded, and then you've got bone on the right here, and they used. So they used um, aluminum oxide, which is a very, very hard powder, which has caused all the scarring. Um, but I, I don't think I would use aluminum oxide, you know, on a fossil. This is a little bit of from the green sands. So the ESC in green sand, this is a bit of fish. It was unrecognizable. You couldn't see there's bone in there really. It was one little piece of bone and I put it under the micro air abrasion with dolomite and got this really cool uh, bit of bone out of it. There's still a little bit of green sand stuck onto it, but I mean, 
someone that knows fish could probably <laughs> tell you tell you what that is from a fish if it is a fish this is a crab so this crab is a timidocostinus giganteus and it's got this weird growth which a few people have told me is probably iron pyrite growth and it does look like iron pyrite growth uh, this crab is full of iron pyrite it's got false gold going in everywhere you can't acid prep crabs because they are also calcium carbonate so they'll dissolve at the same rate um, same as shells and probably a few other things i forgot north lloyds uh, ammonites you can't really prep them with acid you have to use micro air abrasion and i use dolomite so this is before and then this is a close-up of that claw and you can see how beautiful the texture is that it's leaving behind if i tried this with my air scrub the air scrub would just knock these little bits of pyrite off um, even if you came in with a tiny one you might be able to with a really delicate one under a microscope but i don't know if you'll be able to get into those little nooks and crannies there and this is the top and i only spent 20 minutes on it uh, so you get a really good result from that here's my setup so i've got my blasting chamber this is just a normal one from like uh, super cheap auto or one of those places i got it online on trade me as i try to do with a lot of my equipment there's the air scrub, oh, sorry, the, the hose coming in for the micro air abrasion. And then you've got those gloves so the, the dust doesn't come out. I've got this uh, regulator with a little bit of a water filter. And then I've got this, uh, these desiccant beads. So you've got these desiccant beads that take out the last little bit of moisture. Because if you get any moisture into your system, this dolomite powder just clogs up. And then it's a, a real mission to clean everything again. Um, Talk a little bit about the media I've been using. So sodium bicarbonate, I haven't found a really good place to give me sodium bicarb that's between 50 and 100 microns. The dolomite that I've used, uh, you can see over here, this is just from Bunnings. So I paid $20 for that bag of dolomite from the Golden Bay. And I sifted that with my, with 100 micron and 60 micron. And whatever I caught between them was my media. And it took an afternoon. It wasn't a quick. It wasn't a quick thing. Um, I've got some other ones I'm going to uh, experiment with. I've got the aluminium oxide, which is the harshest one. So if you look over here, it's got that Mohs of nine. The weight dolomite is relatively um, low. Yet yeah, three point five to four. I've also heard that you don't actually abrade the fossil. You actually those little particles are actually knocking the sediment away which is why you can use a something that's got like a Mohs of 3.5 to remove a matrix that's harder. So I'm not, I'm not too clued up yet on that, but apparently that's how it works. I've done a bit of reading up on it. And then I've got this iron powder and I'm not sure if this is the right iron powder, but I'm going to experiment with it. And they use iron powder quite a bit in Germany uh, for their fossils. And micro air abrasion is really popular in the green river formation as well for that really nice soft uh, matrix. Then digital prepping. Uh, this is something that's really cool and this kind of blew my mind. So on the right hand side here, those are some really big teeth that I found at Glen Africa. And in if you can look at that concretion, that's a very hard concretion. And one someone that I know, Joseph uh, Bevert, he's at Ansto, so in Australia, where they do some really cool tech and he runs the dingo neutron scanner so he said well send it over to me i'll scan it because you can't really get good results with traditional ct scan on these really thick uh concretions that's a that's a pretty big concretion that so i sent it over to him and he got the neutron scanner going at it and this is looking inside it you can kind of see that looks like a part of the mandible over there maybe rostrum i'm not sure and then you've got these teeth sticking out. And he gave it to me as an image stack. So it's a whole bunch of these layers. So he's basically layered through this rock. And I'll show you what it looks like. And it's, it's pretty amazing. So as soon as this technology you know, keeps progressing, you're going to be able to prep a fossil without having to do anything to it. Let's see, where did I put that one now? Oh, sorry, we forgot the micro air abrasion. I'll just quickly show you the micro air abrasion. So this is that crab. And if you just keep your eye on this section over here, it's very difficult to film through that blasting chamber, but you can see the micro air abrasion just taking away 
uh, that matrix there from that top of that little bit there. And you can see the spray coming out. It's very therapeutic using this micro aerobration. It's kind of like power washing. It's very, very fun and it's quiet. You don't have to wear you know, uh, hearing protection. It's very quiet. Uh, it's just, you have to keep the dust inside that chamber. You don't want that dust going everywhere. The nice thing about the dolomite is you can reuse it. So I was able to reuse about 50% of it, um, I would say. I'm not seeing that video that I made on that one. But I'll show you the 3D model itself. So, sorry. So let's jump over to Blender. So this is Blender as a free program. And what I did is I 3D scanned that block of teeth. So you can see there's there's a tooth over there, there's a tooth, uh, another tooth over there. There's there's quite a few. I think there's 15 teeth in your 12 teeth. Don't don't know exactly. Oh wait, I could probably count there. There's 11 teeth in there. So in this block, there's 11 sperm whale teeth, which is quite something. And what's what he's done is he's give he scans with all those slices. Um, Andrew Cuff in the UK said he's quite a, a genius at these kind of 3D images. What he'll do is he'll create those or take those pictures and put them into a 3D model for me, which I can then overlay into this fossil uh, to show what the teeth are looking like and where they are in the concretion. So this is awesome for prepping because now I know where the teeth are. So what I can do is I can, uh, let's find a nice tooth. Let's look at this one. It's one of the bigger ones. This is, I think, yeah, that's a nice big tooth. So you can see that's the tooth over there. And if I just want to have a look at it quickly, I can just pop it up out of there. And that's the tooth. Now, as the resolution of these scans get better, you'll be able to 3D print this and then be able to, you know, probably have enough info there to be able to say kind of, you know, what animal's teeth are these. And you can do this with any of these. Uh, so I can go look at tooth number seven and I can just pop it up out there and then put it back in. So this is quite, quite amazing that you can do this. And while we talking about 3D models. Um, this is the 3D model of that piece you saw that I showed earlier. And what I do with the models is I just put them on Sketchfab. So there's that, that piece you saw. And now everyone, anyone in the world can download this and use a 3D printer to print this out uh, for themselves. Okay, back to this. So I mentioned, so I've got some of my fossils on Sketchfab and uh, it's a great way to share fossils. So it's free to put fossils on there. And I've got, uh, this is a really nice bullfish skull, Eocene bullfish skull that I found on, washed up on the beach uh, down in Otago. Uh, and now I've got people all over the world printing out my fossils. So this is Cody in the USA. And he's printed out that big fossil crab that I prepped and he can print it out himself now. And if you want to, you can paint it and it looks exactly like the real thing. I should have brought one back here, but I've got one or two that I've painted myself and it looks exactly like the real thing. So I don't send fossils out of the country. Um, I, I'm more than happy to send it to schools and uh, students in New Zealand, but I try and keep them all in New Zealand. And um, this is kind of my workflow at the bottom here. So I find a fossil, like you saw in some of those videos, document the location, the photo, video, GPS coordinates, then I prep it. Uh, then I create a digital copy of it. So you've got a digital copy here of the fossils, and then I donate it to a museum. So I try not to hang on to fossils because otherwise you run out of space and someone has to look after them. So as if I have an important fossil, um, I really want the museums to have it. So. I've got a few people coming past my place every now and again, and they take away what they want. Uh, yeah, I try not to hang on to those. <laughs> and speaking of digital fossils, so when I was prepping that penguin fossil, uh, no, I don't have a, uh, a background in biology, so I didn't know what I was going to expect. So I went online and I found some 3D models of penguin bones. And this is a humerus. I think these are from emperor penguins, so they're quite large. And I could 3D print these. And while I was prepping, I just had them kind of next to me. 
So while I was prepping, I could have a look at them and kind of know what to expect. Because one of the big things with prepping is you don't want to run into a piece of bone with the air scribe and shatter it, especially with a bird like a penguin or a flying bird. Their bones are very brittle, uh, fish as well. Uh, fish do really well with acid prep, actually. And there's a nice tarsometatarsis there with some of the wing elements. And then the other cool thing is I can make my own model. So you might see this behind me. There's my little bush mower uh, that I 3D printed. It took about 600 hours to 3D print, but you're not watching it. It's kind of doing its own thing. And then I just glued it together. So now I've got a nice little bush mower that I can take along to schools and show them. And the kids are really amazed by this. It weighs like maybe three kilograms, this, this whole model. So they can come along and touch it. I don't have to worry about them breaking it. And I've just finished printing another really big tarsometer tarsus. This is from the, the heavy footed mower, I think it is. Um, but yeah, it's a lot bigger than that one at the back there. And the cool thing is now I can print out all the mower TMTs and put them next to each other and be able to compare them. So it's, it's so cool being able to just go and 3D print them. And 3D printers have come down in price. Um, they're about $500 now. And this mower costs about the plastic that I used in it was maybe $120. So it's not very expensive at all to 3D print your own. And then, of course, um, over the years that I've been looking at fossils, I've asked many, many questions to many, many people. So this is just a small list of the people that I want to say thanks to for answering all my questions. Uh, yeah, it's definitely, I don't, uh, I don't uh, feel that I would have been able to make some of the videos that I did without, you know, being able to ask so many questions. And thanks so much, everyone, for listening to me talk about fossils. It was really awesome. I love talking about fossils. <laughs>